Hello, and welcome to Universe Sandbox 2. So, I'm actually revisiting a suggestion from AAV asking, can a black hole destroy a neutron star? The reason why I want to actually revisit this is because it's actually one of my more popular videos now, and there's a lot of misconceptions. First off, a lot of people thought it was going to be like an educational video or something like that because of the way it's just titled. I do have Universe Sandbox 2 in the thumbnail, but people, like, it drew in a lot of audience that was probably outside of my normal community, my normal channel and all that, so a lot of people were really confused by that. Um, yeah, the, the uh, suggestions I do, the, like, suggestions and everything are actually for this game. It's not actually, like, in general space terms or educational or anything like that. It's just, like, can it destroy that in this game? So, I'm just gonna go over a few misconceptions. Uh, actually, Let's go ahead and just drop in Sagittarius A. So, very, very big black hole. Eh, let's go with something a little bit smaller. Let's just go with like 100 suns. And let's go ahead and drop in basically anything. Let's put the sun next to it. So this one's equivalent to 100 suns. Here's the sun. If I just place it as a still object. Well, it's gone. There you got a fragment. That's about all. Anything that comes in contact with a black hole in this game typically gets deleted for the most part. There's some exceptions to this, but as you see, it's drifting now because the sun pulled it a little bit. But now it's equivalent to 101 suns, so it just deletes the object and adds the mass to the black hole. I've explained this in many other videos. Um, basically, there is uh, some exceptions to this. You can actually have an object, I believe, scrape by a black hole. Let's use something a little bit smaller. Let's just use the sun again. Yeah, I do believe you could actually have an object scrape by a black hole and it will not actually destroy it. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that with the sun. No, it just got, gets caught in the rush limit. Which actually brings me on to another su subject. Uh, somebody did post a comment saying black holes have event horizons, not rush limits. That is incorrect. They do have rush limits. Rush limits are the basically... Okay, let's go ahead and just pause time here so you can see what's going on. The rush limit is the point when... A mass becomes so close to the actual object next, like the uh, larger mass here, the denser object. And the tidal effects are greater on this side, on the uh, closer side, than they are from the further side. So it's actually causing so much pull that it's essentially going to start breaking it apart, breaking everything into fragments, and turn into a beautiful ring or accretion disk. The event horizon you're thinking of is the essentially the black part of the black hole where light cannot escape once you're at the event horizon you can no longer escape a black hole you're basically destined to continue falling into it and that is what the event horizon is the rush limit is just the point where the tidal effects basically break apart the orbiting mass or mass is falling in so we've basically formed an accretion disk even though it doesn't really look like a rendition of an accretion disk. That's essentially an accretion disk in this game. So, what other comments do we have on that video? Um, would a Nokia 3310 survive a black hole? Um, maybe. See, the thing is, I know it's a very, very durable phone, and it's basically indestructible, but the Nokia 3310 was actually not even really released in that many countries. In fact, uh, there's actually a lot of other Nokia products that were very similar to 3310. The 3310's kind of the staple of phones of that time. They they all kind of looked very similar to the 3310 around those times. But yeah, Nokia actually had a lot of other products that were much more global and a lot more used than the 3310. The 3310's actually one of their lesser popular products. In fact, I believe it was exclusive to basically Asian continents and countries. I could be wrong about that though. I don't really have my facts too straight about that. But would a Nokia 3310 survive? Oh, it would consume this black hole. So what else? Um, let's see. Okay, so just for a proof of concept, I'm going to go ahead and drop a pulsar directly into this black hole. Just to kind of show what would happen. It's going to fall in very, very quickly. And nope, it didn't even fall in. It just kind of flew off. It's actually very difficult to make an object fall into a uh, greater mass like this. Because it's just going to want to slingshot it out. I think that one actually fell right into the black hole. 
So there you go. Essentially, if a pulsar collides with a black hole, it gets deleted. That's basically it. Um, question of can a black hole destroy a neutron star? I mean, I guess kind of, of course it will. It doesn't do anything crazy like a supernova or make it explode into some weird planetary nova or anything. Mainly because a neutron star is already really, really dense. And if a neutron star was actually any more dense, it would collapse into a black hole. So there you go. Simple question to answer, nothing really too scientific there, it's just basically a neutron star falling into a black hole. Another misconception I got was, uh, people were saying that I wasn't using a neutron star because it's labeled PSR, abbreviating pulsar. Pulsars are neutron stars, they just have magnetic jets that shoot out of the north and south pole of the neutron star. And they essentially, basically spin in such a fashion that they're actually claimed to be the most accurate clocks in our universe. So, that's another misconception that I got in that video. Um, let's see if we could actually do that. I don't know if it's actually going to be easily possible. As you can see, it's spinning very, very quickly. Pulsars can spin, I don't know what, like the limit of their frequency, but a lot of pulsars that we know about spin like up to probably 30 times per second. That's their spinning rate. That's how fast they actually rotate. For something that is essentially the size of a mountain, that is that is very fast. So let's see. I don't think we are actually going to add magnetic. Yeah, let's see if we could actually add in like a cool. No, it doesn't. I don't think so. I don't think it's actually going to be possible. Let's see. Let's just add in like ten thousand Tesla. And there's no cool gamma ray jets. Well, that's unfortunate. I think there is a way we could actually do this, though. That would be to add in a pulsar. And then simply throw something like Earth at it. So we're going to have to slow, slow down time a lot to actually make this happen. Okay, so let's add in a planet. Something that already has a magnetosphere. Something like Earth. Wow. Wow. And just add it as a still object. Here we go. We turned it into a black star. That is very cool. But as you can see, now it actually has giant jets firing out of the north and south pole. And if we actually speed this up, they should rotate too. No, they're pretty static currently. Let's see if we can change the radius back down to like one kilometer. Uh, let's go with like two kilometers. Ah, there we go. That's looking a little bit more like a pulsar. This chest probably should be bigger. Let's see if I could actually increase that now. Cool if I actually can. Eh, uh, they don't appear to be getting larger, actually. Ah, uh, they're one Tesla now, and it's not any larger. Well, that's unfortunate. But there you go. There's essentially a uh, pulsar. Let's change the surface temperature to about 10,000 degrees Kelvin. Beautiful. But I think what we need is a little bit of, uh, should be rotating. Um, let's make the rotational period, let's go for seconds, 0 0.25, so four times per second it should spin. Oh, whoops. No, that should be right. Yes, now it's spinning very quickly. That's looking a bit more like a pulsar. So there's a pulsar. It's essentially just a uh, neutron star with gamma ray jets. Very simple. So that's just to kind of answer that little misconception. And there was a few others, but I don't think I'm going to actually get around to, to them in this video. I just kind of wanted to make this little update video to kind of explain what was going on. I did end up adding a disclaimer to that video kind of explaining how my Universe Sandbox 2 videos works. Um, for the most part, yeah, like I said, they are user suggestions for this game. They weren't actually supposed to be like in general, just based on theoretical physics and all that. It's entirely just something that people want me to test in the game. I just do those suggestions. I don't come up with them myself. Uh, 
I don't feel like I am qualified to actually teach people things, so I don't actually try to make educational videos. But since it actually brought in such a wide audience from outside of my community and outside of the Universe Sandbox 2 community, a lot of people didn't know. This game is an alpha game, it's kind of buggy, it's not really completely accurate, even though it is being worked on, and there's a lot of work going into it. So I hope one day it'll actually become one of the, like a really, really good simulator, but right now it's still in alpha, there's bugs, things are not exactly accurate. Black holes don't exactly have any cool effects, they tend to just delete things and just change their mass to kind of add in the thing they deleted on top of their mass, and that's really about it. Anyways, if you want to see more videos like this, please do subscribe, and until next time, I'll see you guys in the next video.